Over the years, a number of MBTI bashing pieces have made the rounds. One of the most cited opponents is Adam Grant, who has been eloquent and showing research evidence in his favor. He's inspired many others to hit into the same grooves, to the point that social media algorithms keep bringing them up perpetuating his narrative. Unfortunately, a lot of his criticisms are unfounded, outdated. He does not provide a balanced review of the big five, in my opinion, or the trait approach that he is advocating. And his followers have added some confounding variables as well, all of which I'll address in this video. So if you are confused about how come people still use MBTI if it's supposed to be so bad, this is for you. You'll find links to all the references and timestamps for each of the arguments in the video description. In case we haven't met or you wonder who I am to even share my opinion on this topic, I have been an MBTI master practitioner since 2012, but I did not stop there. I'm also certified in the Dr. Linda Behrens core method and Dr. Dario Nardi's neuroscience of personality personality. Last year I graduated with distinction and I now also hold a master's in applied psychology. So I think that puts me in a good position to provide some context for this conversation from both sides. Let's jump in. Grant and his followers argue that the MBTI questionnaire is based on pseudoscience developed by a Carl Jung obsessed homemaker, that it is not reliable or valid, that it is worded too positively and sounds like a horoscope, that it does not actually predict behavior and is therefore useless, especially in the workplace where it is often applied. In his latest essay, Grant also goes a step further and calls into question Jung's underlying theory. Instead, he prefers the Big Five assessment because it was developed by psychologists, is data-driven and therefore more reliable, uh, valid and predictive, i.e. useful. First things first, it is important to differentiate the theory from the tools. Let's start with the difference between Jungian type theory and the trait approach. This is the basic context for what we are even debating here and it should clear up some of the points already. The trait approach assumes that every person is inherently the same, made up of the same ingredients, and that individual variation is down to different quantities. In other words, we are all the same, we all have the same traits as building blocks, and we just have different amounts of each one and that explains our superficial uniqueness. Traits are considered stable and independent of context, which means the situation you're in or the person you're with doesn't matter. The trait approach assumes your personality traits will always lead you to behave the same way, no matter your age or your circumstances. Personality is an area of research in the field of psychology. The trait approach to personality is aligned with the positivist or realist ontology, which assumes that there is one truth out there in the world that you can find and measure. Because traits are considered the same in everyone and stable, they are quantifiable and can be counted. Measuring how much of each trait people have allows for statistical analyses, which often creates bell curves, where the majority is somewhere in the middle. These bell curves represent the normal distribution in a population and are used, for example, to allocate resources for public health initiatives like addiction treatments. One problem is putting people on a bell curve places those with standard deviations, you know, the ones in the, in the sides, at a disadvantage. Even diagnosing medical conditions based on statistically determined norms isn't reflective of the whole human experience. So put differently, not everything that can be measured counts and not everything that counts can be measured. One of the tools that has been devised to apply this approach is the Big Five. It's a questionnaire where people indicate how much they think they have of each building block trait. It has no underlying theory, but was developed by psychologists who assumed that individual differences can be encoded in single word descriptions. So based on a lexical analysis, 18,000 words were reduced and abstracted into 4,500 traits describing a structure of personality. The majority of these traits are thought to have a genetic basis, which led one proponent called Isenck to posit that an individual's ability to change or change their behavior is limited by their genes. 
Interestingly, Isaac also proposed that traits can cluster together to form types, but I guess the trait theorists didn't really run with that. Either way, the top five traits that these other words can be abstracted into are openness, conscientiousness, extraversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. In the interest of balance, here are some points of critique about the big five. Again, the whole video discussing these critiques will be linked below. Now, psychologists want their research to be taken seriously and therefore treat it like a hard science, kind of like physics. As a reminder, the hard sciences are Naturwissenschaften. They are about laws and immutable objects. The positivist, realist, one truth that can be pinpointed that applies everywhere, all the time, to everyone. But people don't always obey laws and they're also not stable objects. They're actually dynamic subjects, a system containing other systems within a larger social system. So Jungian type theory, on the other hand, posits that the human psyche contains different structures like the ego, the unconscious, the shadow, the persona, and a true self we come into during midlife. Type theory assumes that we come into the world with a predisposition to use our brain in a certain way and that there is a developmental trajectory that we follow as we grow older. The ways we use our brains are known today as the eight cognitive functions, although there may be more flavors as I'll show in a minute. Jung's theory posits that one or two of those functions will differentiate and dominate ego consciousness by the time we're in our 20s, while the opposites get repressed into the shadow until it bubbles up to be integrated to create a balance in the psyche, usually during midlife. Type theory assumes that we are whole unique beings with the same psychic structures and pro access to the same cognitive processes, but that this innate preference based both on biology and genetics and our surroundings, and I'll show evidence for that in a minute as well, will drive our ego to develop the personality and behavioral patterns of a type. So unlike trait theory, type theory does not break the whole into its constituent parts because it is the relation of the parts that they have to one another that gives a type meaning. Dr. Linda Behrens has spent her life working with type as a system. Go check her out. I'm linking her website below as well. This holistic view of personality fits with the relativist constructivist ontology, which assumes that personality is a dynamic construct and is co-created in different situations and during interactions with different human beings. And yes, that is difficult, but not impossible to count or quantify. Calling his theory pseudoscience is a bit of a stretch because Jung observed his colleagues, his patients and other people for 20 years in his practice before describing the patterns he noted in how people gather information, make decisions, which informs how they behaved and the kinds of complexes they experienced. This process is actually called empirical observation. It's a valuable form of scientific research that is still used in many fields, including psychology. While Jung never developed a tool to test his theory, luckily two ladies in America read his books and got to work. So over many decades of refinement, this questionnaire became the MBTI, where people sort between a variety of opposing cognitive functions to determine which one or two processes they have most conscious access to. Since it doesn't measure quantities, the result is not a bell curve, but a four letter code that is shorthand for how the eight preferences are aligned on everyone's internal compass. This awareness can then be used as a map to explore unfamiliar behaviors to encourage personal growth. And crucially, it assumes that change and change of behavior is possible at any point. I think this should cover that Jung didn't make up three types. And in terms of evidence, as requested, I propose taking a look at Dr. Dario Nardis's work, where over the last 15 years or so, he has analyzed neurological activity in the neocortices of hundreds of participants using EEG caps, finding that people with different type preferences indeed use their brains in different ways. Going back to my earlier point of the interplay of type and environment, during this research, Dario also found that the work we do and the hobbies we have, so anything we do habitually influence how we use and express our type preferences. 
Most recently, he has expanded on the eight functions and identified different flavors and combinations they might show up in, expanding the potential type table from 16 to 64. Again, not just making them up, but based on the neural patterns he empirically observed using EEG data, as well as incorporating insights from Dr. Helen Fisher's work on neurotransmitters. A great way to get started with that rabbit hole is probably his book, The Magic Diamond. In terms of another piece of evidence, I'd also like to suggest checking out Dr. Mina Barimani's dissertation, where she describes a statistical latent class analysis of the type reports of over 5,000 participants. She found strong support for Jung's theory of opposites, and I'll link that document below as well. When you Google her name, you will find a few YouTube interviews as well, so enjoy. So much for Jung's theory itself, but this whole conversation started because Grant and his followers also think the MBTI is bogus. So let's get back to the tool and the main criticisms leveled against it. I think we covered that the instrument is based on a sound theory, which has scientific support. The next point the writer of the New York Times article made was that Myers-Briggs were young obsessed homemakers who didn't even have a degree. To this I say, your misogyny is showing, you might want to tuck that back in. Being self-taught, especially in those days, is actually completely badass, but maybe you weren't aware that academia also doesn't always get it right. For example, the field of psychology had a replication crisis they are still trying to recover from, which I think supports my earlier point that the study of human behavior is not the same as the study of an object in space. But you don't just have to take my word for it. Much cleverer people have called for allowing psychology to be a humanistic science instead of a hard one as well. Also, you're brushing off decades of computing work these ladies have done, cataloging, thousands of responses, doing weighting and reliability and validity testing by hand, and that's just rude. But finally, the MBTI step two was updated and developed in collaboration with psychometric statisticians and psychologists in the 1990s. So this whole point of criticism is outdated. Next. Is the MBTI reliable and is it valid? According to a couple of meta-analyses from 2002 and again from 2017, yes it is. If you're interested in the psychometric background and process of how questionnaires get assembled and the work that goes into them, I suggest you check out Mark Majors' videos linked below. Now, is it perfect? Hell no. There is no such thing as a perfect questionnaire. Every self-reporting instrument, the big five included, is limited by how well the participants know themselves. By definition, every self-reporting questionnaire is a form of me search and will give you a result based on the information that you put in. If you answer questions one way one day and then another way the next, your results will change. That's why the MBTI is supposed to be administered by a trained professional who will then discuss your results with you to make sure your result is actually your best fit. Which brings me to another important related point. The MBTI is not available for free online, it is licensed. The aforementioned in New York Times uh, writer actually reported a result that she got from 16 personalities, which incidentally is a trait questionnaire giving you a type result. So please use with extreme caution. As explained earlier, those two approaches are very different and they operate from two very different positions, so I wouldn't trust it. If you'd like to learn more about issues with Test falsely claiming to be the MBTI on social media, check out Teresa Moon's video that I've linked below. Now, if you're still watching, well done, uh, and you're curious about your type, of course there are also other ways to arrive at your type information. I've mentioned Dr. Nardi's Keys to Cognition questionnaire before. It's free and we'll send you an email with a uh, link with more infos, but I'd also like to mention Dr. Linda Behrens again, her mul multiple models approach in which I was certified in 2012. She views type also from a more holistic perspective and uh, again, I'll link her website below. And lastly, does the MBTI put people in a box and predict behavior? Where is the evidence that it's actually useful in the workplace? Jung's type theory and the MBTI by extension do not categorize people, they categorize types of consciousness. 
Type in the Jungian and MBTI sense is the pattern of observable behavior someone exhibits in normal circumstances. For example, an extrovert thinking type is likely to appreciate an objective, logical, cause and effect kind of explanation. As such, they are likely to use specific language focusing on the thing itself. Whereas an extroverted feeling type might use metaphors and focus more on the impact of the thing on the people involved. In a crisis or when a house is on fire, both types will act more spontaneously because again, types are dynamic and it is assumed that they adapt behavior to the situation they're in. So if you call that a box, explain to me how the assumption of stable traits is a sign of setting you free. As for predicting behavior, I don't actually think any questionnaire or theory can predict behavior because they do not provide the full picture. Here's what I mean by that. In medicine and in psychology, researchers are adopting the biopsychosocial model. Since type and MBTI look primarily at the psychological or cognitive part, the biology and social context have influences that the tool simply cannot cover. That is not to say that types don't also have a biological and genetic basis. Going back to my earlier point about the interplay of type and biology, here is evidence from research studying twins who were raised apart that suggests that some cognitive functions are actually heritable. It also matters when and where you were raised, which gender you were raised in, and if we even broaden the circle a little bit into attachment theory, we know that your parents' personalities played a big role in forming who you grew up to be as well. Assuming that the endocrine system and nervous systems are linked, your behavior and your responses to any questionnaire will be influenced by whether you've had a good night's sleep and how hungry, hydrated, hormonal or horny you are. There are a million variables to consider. My point is type doesn't explain everything, neither does attachment or trait, by the way. There is no one test that reliably predicts what someone is going to say or do at work, at home, in a relationship or anywhere. That doesn't mean type insights aren't valuable to understand how you've made decisions in the past, how you got here and what you might try differently going forward. But that's where you need to chat with someone to go deeper. Finally, the criticism of MBTI used for recruitment and predicting performance at work usually neglects to mention that easily accessible MBTI ethical guidelines, which clearly state that it's illegal in many states to discriminate hiring based on the MBTI result, and also that it is not designed to predict job performance. The MBTI is meant to be descriptive, not predictive, of preferences, not absolutes, which point to, not determine, patterns of behavior like communication, conflict and change management processes. As such, it does not predict job performance. In fact, the MBTI never claimed that it would. And before we go back to the box argument, all types can do all jobs. However, it is also true that certain types seem to self-select into certain job categories based on their innate preferences. For example, law students were more than three times as likely to have a thinking preference than a feeling preference. And police officers are nearly four times more likely to be sensing types rather than intuiting types. There's another video that also mentions correlational evidence citing intuiting types tend to consistently score higher in intelligence tests over sensing and that judging types tend to have higher incomes than perceiving types. But yes, those results will heavily depend on the kinds of intelligence that were tested and the kinds of industries that were valued in that particular local economy. Oh, and I almost forgot, if MBTI and uh, type are worded too positively, what happens to employees who take the big five and score high on neuroticism and low on conscientiousness? Is there any research on that? Or do employees recognize the words and choose the ones that they believe are expected? So how do you avoid the garbage in garbage out issue when one of your traits links to potential medical issues? And just for the record, with type, there is no wrong type to be because it promotes an awareness and acceptance of who you are at your core first. And then there is a map pointing towards how to develop and practice your opposite preferences to bridge the gaps if you so desire. Type theory has a goal, and that is psychic balance. 
individuation, embracing all of life's experiences. It's not trying to diagnose you. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground. In summary, the trait versus type debate mainly depends on your definition of what personality is. Is it stable or dynamic? Do you think we're all the same or that we're different? Do you think personality is measurable or it has to be experienced? And here's another quick list from Richard's video. In a nutshell, both Jung's theory and the MBTI do have a scientific basis. There is current research by Dario and Mina that supports Jung's theory. The MBTI provides reliable and valid information, provided it is used ethically and with realistic expectations or in alignment with what it was designed to do. And neither MBTI nor type theory limits your options in any way. On the contrary, they provide you with a compass to explore the map of your psyche and to better understand your life's experiences. If you found this context helpful, I share more insights on my YouTube channel and in my newsletter. Please subscribe to both. I'm happy to respond to any questions you want to put in the comments here. And I'm also available for type coaching if you'd like to go deeper. You know where to find all the links. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time.